share with you a little bit of my research and research of others. But uh, we'll be talking about the keys to managing nutrition to control plant disease. And agriculture, we need to re remember that farming is really managing an ecology. That ecology consists of the plant, of the abiotic or the physical environment over on your right, and then a very dynamic biological environment in the soil. And not just in the soil, but there's also a very dynamic biological environment on leaf surfaces and on the, uh, on the plant. So we sometimes forget that that biology covers both areas and we're seeing that especially with a lot of our disease problems, our contamination of some of our food products with Salmonella or Listeria. It's because we have killed that microflora, that uh, biological component on the leaf surface so that the pathogens then are able to infest or and, uh, contaminate many of our crops. And so in the States, we've had a lot of recalls, 14 million uh, eggs, for instance, uh, romaine lettuce, a number of recalls. And it's all because that biological component, protective component on the leaves, has been destroyed because of the antibiotic use of glyphosate. It's a very powerful antibiotic that changes the biological balance in the soil as well as on the plant. But we're managing that biology when we're farming. And then you have that other component in this ecology, your pathogens and your insects and your stresses that come along in that, that where, where we want everything that we do in this management to support the plant, to make conditions as conducive for yield and quality and growth of the plant and as least conducive for the stresses, the pathogens and the pests, uh, the environmental variables that we have. And so that's really what we're doing when we're farming. We have a lot of tools that we can use to do that with from tillage and water management fertilization, uh, crop sequencing, but they all have something to do with nutrition, but you can't do anything, make any changes in this ecology without affecting the interrelationship of all four of those components. So you can't just say, well, I'm gonna use a silver bullet and it's only going to have this effect because any changes that we make in this ecology are going to have an interacting effect with all of them, either positive or negative, and then generally positive, we hope. But they all have to do then with nutrition. So you have your 17 essential nutrients and three beneficial nutrients that a plant needs for optimum production. And you can see, we can trace all of those nutrients back to various conditions and the various stresses and various uh, uh, pests and diseases, as well as the, the need for those nutrients then for growth and production, nutrient density. So when we look at a disease, for instance, quite often what you're seeing is really uh, a symptom of nutrient deficiency because diseases can influence the availability of nutrients, some of them very specifically. So that when uh, I was in the Netherlands, I was asked to visit a, a large greenhouse operation, 40 acres, all under glass. And as soon as I walked in and I turned to the owner and he said, he had told me that he was having serious problems with some diseases and so I turned to the owner and I said, well, you have an extreme manganese deficiency. He said, no, I have a disease problem. 
I said, well, you have a disease problem because you have a severe manganese deficiency. And uh, so we started looking at the leaves and looking at the plant. And you could see then, when you focused on that, you could see the visible symptoms of the nutrition. But we look at the disease, in this case, it was verticillium wilt. He had peppers on one side and tomatoes on the other that he exported to, to the European uh, countries. And all he was seeing was the dying plant. He didn't look to see what some of the other finer symptoms were, but they are all very typical of what you would see with the manganese deficiency minus the, the full death. Usually with manganese deficiency, we see that intervenal chlorosis and green veins on the plants or with the grass species, maize and sugarcane. It's kind of a, a streaking with manganese and also with zinc. But uh, uh, it took him a few minutes to, for me to explain uh, the relationship then of manganese in inhibiting the enzymes that the fungus needed to cause the will. Had a similar situation uh, in California just a week ago with uh, walnuts. And they call this new disease walnut collapse. You get six years and the tree does very well after uh, in that sixth year, but it starts to bear quite heavily in the sixth year. And the seventh year, all of a sudden with one rootstock, the tree just literally collapses, just, just wilts and everything crashes. And uh, I said, well, you have, it looks just like xylella, fastidiosa infection, the scorched diseases. But it happens so quickly and you have good growth up before that. But at the sixth year, you really put the stress on that plant when it starts bearing, and then the seventh year it's really bearing very heavily and it can't get the nutrients up because the vascular system is plugged. That plugging takes place because the bacteria produces an enzyme that oxidizes manganese. And it will also oxidize or also combine calcium and phosphate to form calcium phosphate or calcium manganese phosphate. But it's usually the oxidation of the manganese that then triggers that whole reaction. And for xylella, we say, well, we have a, a biofilm that's formed that does the plugging. What that biofilm is, is insoluble calcium manganese phosphate that's occurred because the bacteria produces a peroxidase or a lacase enzyme. Either one of them will cause the, or start that reaction of precipitation of the minerals uh, by oxidizing manganese, and then you get the calcium and the phosphorus combined, and all of that little brown layer that you see in the vascular system is all just uh, insoluble minerals because the plant can only utilize the soluble form, MN2 plus form of manganese, and it can't use the calcium phosphate, it's insoluble. So you have that plugging then with the carbohydrate materials that are being translocated in the, in the vascular system. And so it's a matter of blocking that enzyme, and we do that with zinc and copper. And so if you bring the zinc and copper level up, even though the bacteria is still there in the plant, you're not going to have any uh, disease or any real losses because you've prevented that precipitation starting to start with. And so for citrus variegated chlorosis, which is xylella fastidiosis. This is where we worked, and it took us eight years to work the system out. Here, uh, 
about 18 years ago uh, when it was introduced into, a little less than 18, into Brazil. And Shioshi Amati got a group of us together so that we started looking and at the, uh, this new disease that was threatening the citrus industry of Brazil. And uh, once we identified, first thing we identified, all well, the symptoms are of zinc and manganese deficiency. And so we started making some foliar applications. And you saw that the tree would green up, continue bearing, but we were out there every month spraying with manganese and zinc. So that we needed something more permanent. So we looked at uh, what was causing that, that uh, bacterium to become so virulent, and it turns out that's glyphosate. Well, everybody used glyphosate for weed control. And uh, so we figured if we need to remove the, the glyphosate, we still have to have weed control, and looked at various climax ecosystem crops, or some of the crops that were, or plants that were available that would inhibit nitrification. All of your climax ecosystem crops inhibit nitrification to give you an ammonium source of nitrogen. Well, ammonium in the soil feeds the reducing organisms that make iron and manganese more available uh, for plant uptake. And then they also when you start that process, you also synergize and get your zinc and your copper levels up. So that what we did was went with brachiaria grass, planted it between the rows, mulched it underneath the tree. Can't get much better uh, herbicide than, than darkness. And uh, got a good three or four inch mulch, mowed it twice a year to keep that mulch there. We didn't have to do any more fertilization. We just fertilized the grass between the rows. And then as it would decompose, it provided the nutrition for the tree. But it was in the, the nitrogen was in the ammoniacal farm so that we kept our zinc and manganese available. And in one year, we had restored the tree to its full nutrient sufficiency. It took a little longer to clean the plumbing out but in three years, we were producing 110% of the yield at a much higher quality than they were before the xylella was introduced. Well, the growers in the citrus industry said that it's uh, not going to work because you have the sharpshooter insect that vectors the pathogen. And as it uh, so said, yeah, you may clean it up now, but it's the pathogen is going to be right back with the vector. <clears throat> that doesn't happen because we change the environment. For a disease, you have to have three conditions before you have disease expression. You have to have a susceptible crop. You have to have uh, a favorable biology, and you have to have a virulent pathogen. So any we can approach it from any three. The common way that my colleagues in plant pathology do is they look for a silver bullet that's going to kill the bacteria. Good bactericide. Well you can also control those diseases if you change the environment so that it's not expressed. It's not producing those enzymes or some of those things and we'll cover that. How to do that nutritionally as we uh, uh, proceed here. But you only have disease when you have all three of those uh, components coming together. So you have disease escape over here. If you don't have uh, favorable conditions for the pathogen, or we can avoid the pathogen if we don't have it present by changing the environment. And it's only when you have all of those conditions. So that there are many things that we can do besides just going out and looking at that silver bullet as a, as a pesticide. 
we can manage the ecology so that, again, we make conditions as favorable for the plant and as least favorable for the uh, stress or the pathogens or, or uh, insects uh, as possible. Now again, uh, you can see some of those situations. This would be in Idaho. We have uh, grow a lot of potatoes there, fairly well known for it. And our growers, our better growers, have all recognized that if they'll use corn as a pre-plant, maize as a pre-plant for potatoes, it gives them two to four weeks longer growing season, growing period to get those 10 ounce potatoes than it does if you use wheat, for instance, or uh, beans. And that's because maize provides twice as much manganese <clears throat> that's left then for that potato crop. And manganese is a very important element to block the uh, extracellular enzymes of the verticillium will. So it doesn't eliminate the verticillium, but it greatly uh, delays its ability to uh, cause the disease, the wilting. This situation you see up here is just the opposite of what I just mentioned and what most of our growers have experienced. And uh, County agent asked me to work with him. We got all of the 50 big or good growers in the county, all provided their data, and they were complaining about not being able to get bulking. Couldn't get the size out of their potatoes. Well, that's where the premium comes in, where the price is best, and also the increased severity of the verticillium. So after we looked at the three petiole analysis during the season that they take, the soil analysis, nothing stood out to indicate why they'd gone from 35 to 50% uh, of their crop being over 10 ounces down to some of them even just 5%. So they're really taking a beating economically until we ask them the question, well, what's your herbicide program? And all of them that had jumped on the bandwagon the year before with the Roundup Ready maize were all down in that 5 or 10 percent bulking soil, and the others were those who hadn't but had maintained their, their uh, normal corn as a pre-crop were all still up there in that 40, 45 percent in the 10 ounce size. And uh, this is some research that we had done at Purdue University on an IPM, an integrated pest management 40 acre plot that we had where we were looking at three different weed control with three different tillage systems and then three different crops and all uh, combinations there with the crops. And uh, we were trying to explain why crop rotation of soybeans before corn gave us a 8 to 10 percent increase in yield. Well, that didn't take very long to identify that, that the soybeans before the corn was leaving about 30 pounds of nitrogen for the corn crop. But what we couldn't understand initially was why were we getting an 18 to 20 percent increase in soybean yield when corn was the preceding crop? Because we hadn't recognized that there are a lot of these interactions in the soil and a lot of our nutrients are biologically driven because of the biological cycle. And what it turned out when we <clears throat> was that we were providing twice as much manganese for that subsequent soybean crop as the soybeans were or the wheat was. Now when we split that plot and went with the GMO versus the non-GMO corn, we found that the antibiotic activity of the glyphosate, and it's a patented antibiotic, broad spectrum antibiotic, but it against the good guys, not the pathogen. And when we split the plot, 
then you see that we weren't any better than any of the other uh, crop sequences. Uh, we lost that benefit of the corn as the maize is uh, pre-crop for us. So if we look at the nutrients, the 17 uh, essential nutrients and the three beneficial nutrients, you'll find that all of them are reported to reduce certain diseases and uh, all of them are reported to increase certain diseases. Now you can read in the textbook and it'll say, well, yeah, if you add potassium, get your potassium levels up, it'll control your diseases. Well, that's true for some diseases, but not necessarily all of them. There are some that are increased. Now that increase may be from the farm or the, the source of your potassium, whether it's chloride or whether it's uh, uh, carbonate or whether it's sulfate, uh, you'll get a difference if the anion is the factor that, that's really doing the job for you rather than the potassium itself or the cation form. So all of them are reported to have some effect on disease, either increase or decrease. And with nitrogen, you really have two elements up here, and I argued at one time that we ought to say, no, there are 18 essential elements because you have nitrate versus ammonia, and you have different, different physiological pathways that those two forms of nitrogen are utilized in, and that's a powerful tool for us to use because uh, when we want to control disease, we can change the form of nitrogen and have a dramatic effect on the severity of many diseases, either nitrate or the ammonium form. So that a lot of these where you see the variable up there is because in the literature they didn't identify which form of nitrogen they were using. The other thing in your soils, these uh, tropical soils, it's only a matter of a few uh, days or a week or so before ammonium is converted into nitrate nitrogen through the biological process of nitrification. But all of the nutrients are reported to influence some disease so that American Phytopathological Society has published uh, a book that three of us edited and put together uh, on mineral nutrition and plant disease that's it's, uh, available where we look at those nutrients and then the specific interactions with uh, many of our plant diseases. What we're really looking for is a balanced nutrition. We want to keep that plant perking along just as good as it can. We want it to uh, be fully sufficient in all the nutrients, not just for our diet or our animals' dietary needs, but also for its own benefit and disease and stress tolerance, stress resistance. So we're li really looking at that balance because the nutrient balance is important as uh, it functions as a part of a delicately balanced interdependent system of the plant's genetics and the environment. And uh, there are four ways that have been uh, used to associate a particular nutrient with uh, specific diseases. The first is just what do you see when you add a fertilizer? If you're adding nitrogen, do you see an increase or a decrease in disease? Now, quite often that'll depend on the form of nitrogen, as I mentioned a minute ago, but uh, a lot of empirical evidence has just been accumulated over the years so that uh, <clears throat> we can utilize these tools more effectively. The second way is comparing the plant tissue levels of resistant and susceptible plants. Do resistant plants have more calcium or less calcium or more potassium, uh, more zinc? And uh, you see that comparison also 
the comparison of disease and non-disease plants. And then the fourth way that, that uh, uh, specific nutrients have been correlated is with the environmental conditions that would influence a particular nutrient. What's your soil pH? You have an alkaline versus an acid soil. Well, you have a very dramatic difference in availability of copper, manganese, and zinc, for much more available in the acid soils. Calcium and magnesium and uh, sulfur, more available in the more alkaline soils. Uh, sulfur goes both, both ways there, but you can look at all four of these and they all correlate very nicely together to uh, for the specific role of nutrients in disease susceptibility. And just some examples, uh, if you have copper deficiency in the Canadian prairies or across the northern states, uh, Ian Evans would tell the, the growers to get out there with some copper sulfate, some blue vitriol, uh, five or even 10 pounds every five years, or else you're going to have severe ergot. Well, what does copper have to do with ergot? The other, uh, well, uh, the role of copper with an ergot is that if you have ergot deficiency on cereal crops, that you open the floret because it causes male sterility. And so the plant wants to reproduce itself. And in order to do that, it has to have the pollen. If the copper deficiency kills the pollen or it doesn't develop, then the plant will open the gloom and permit uh, other pollen to, to enter. It's no longer self-pollinated. And uh, so when that gloom opens, it also permits the spores of the claviceps fungus to enter and to infect the pistil of the plant uh, and infect it to replace the kernel then with the ergot sclerotia. So it's very important to maintain the copper level, as you see here, both from a yield standpoint as well as from a disease standpoint. You see that effect with powdery mildew of, uh, of wheat. You see with the copper, it's much less severe than it is with the uh, copper deficiency. Now some of our northern uh, uh, wheat growers in Montana and Idaho and Washington uh, several years during the 1960s that they actually made more on the ergot sclerotia selling it or uh, uh, having it, having a severe infection with the late spring frost one year because all the hippies from California would come up and buy the cleanings from the elevators. The wheat was worth about two and a half a bushel the screenings were worth a, a dollar eighty-five a pound because of the ergot sclerotia. Well, there are two things that are in that sclerotia. One is the LSD, the hallucinogenic, and that's why the hippies were coming up was to get their uh, hallucinogenic material, which for them was pretty cheap at a dollar eighty-five a pound. The other thing, it's a very important pharmaceutical because you also have the ergotamine that's produced so that if you go in for surgery or for childbearing, quite often you'll receive a, a shot of ergotamine because it restricts the capillary vessels and prevents hemorrhaging. So very important from a pharmaceutical standpoint in Europe, we had a condition during the dark ages of, of uh, St. Francis fire because they had so much ergot contamination, they weren't able to separate it, the ergot out of their rye and, and wheat breads. It was just all ground together and they had the ergotamine in there that would constrict the capillaries so that people would lose their ears or their nose because of restricted blood flow. 
Now that we separate it out, we don't have that condition and it's a very important pharmaceutical product. Again, you can look at the uh, difference in nu nutrient value or levels in the uh, uh, susceptible and resistant plants. This is uh, with castor bean and uh, relative to botrytis infection. You can see that the resistant has a very high level of calcium. When you have high calcium, you quite often also have low potassium, but uh, that high calcium is involved in binding the pectin and cellulitic materials in the cell wall so that it's hard for the pathogen to penetrate and uh, more resistant to the extracellular enzymes. The susceptible has a very low level of calcium so that the cell wall isn't nearly as protective as the uh, uh, resistant plant. And we can look at that fourth characteristic or fourth factor there, the environmental conditions. And in this situation, you see that all of those conditions that will decrease nitrification, in other words, give you the ammonium form of nitrogen, but also increase manganese availability, will all re reduce the severity of potato scab, or rice blast, take all, phymotropicum root rot, corn stalk rot, and a number of other diseases. Those conditions which stimulate nitrification are cause manganese oxidation, increase the severity of these diseases. And so we see good correlation with all four of those factors uh, uh, relative to uh, disease. Now you can look at a lot of text uh, and that, a lot of books, this book, the green book that we have, I gave Beth a copy of that. But uh, on mineral nutrition and plant disease, there are a lot of tables in that. In this case, you have mag magnesium and relationship to various plant diseases there with either deficiency or uh, excess in that situation, you have table for sulfur. We think of sulfur and copper as being biocides, but they're very critical from a plant physiological standpoint. They're very essential nutrients. Yes, they do have, can have some other biocidal activity, but you have to keep the physiology of the plant, and they're very important for resistance. Uh, in that. So, share with you six keys to using mineral nutrition uh, to control disease. And that's just a picture of, of the book. It's undergoing upgrading, updating now. Uh, so, new version will probably be out about March or April, uh, uh, anticipated here. But those six six keys and to use it, and I'll go through some of the, or all of these. Uh, the first one of those is the genetics of the plant. Selection of your seed or your uh, clonal material for planting is probably the most important thing that a farmer is going to do. First decision he has to make, and you'll find some very wide differences between species of crops and their efficiency for nutrient uptake. Just see in this rye growing in uh, along with the wheat in a low, or low manganese soil in southwestern Indiana. And if you look at the roots on that wheat, it's uh, not just deficient in manganese, but also severely infected with the take-all fungus. So the roots will be all black, very uh, few of them functional, just enough to support a little bit of growth where a rye Roots are all white, prolific in the soil because it's very efficient for taking up the micronutrients. And uh, you can see varietal differences. If you look at the germplasm for all of our crops, we see a tremendous range in nutrient efficiency for, for the various nutrients so that if we really wanted to focus on uh, full optimum crop production, 
tremendous amount that we could do from a breeding program to have that efficiency built into the crop. Now it takes time and you have other factors that you're going to have to to make sure you're compatible with as far as adaptability and those things, but most of our increase in yield that where we're capturing more of that yield potential and quality potential in our crops is because we have increased nutrient efficiency for specific nutrients, even though our breeders may not be uh, uh, identifying that in their selective process. And you can see how very specific changes in that genetic code also have a dramatic effect on certain nutrient efficiency. And so you can't change one thing in that uh, ecology that we're managing in farming without changing a lot of these other things. Just a couple of examples uh, here with genetic engineering, there's always a yield drag. Maybe relatively <coughs> light or it may be quite severe, quite extreme. But when you uh, disrupt the integrity of the genetic code, you affect a lot of other things besides just the one little thing that you may be looking at from a trait standpoint. Roundup Ready soybeans in this variety have a 17% reduction in manganese just with the presence of the Roundup Ready gene, the bacterial gene that's been inserted there. Plant has to work harder and you have 47% reduction in zinc efficiency. Then you add your glyphosate, take advantage of that trait for weed control, very powerful mineral chelator and also antibiotic that affects those nutrients. And you see kind of a double whammy effect that we need to compensate for if we're going to use the technology efficiently in our crop production. Barney Gordon in Kansas showed that it would take two and a half to five pounds of additional manganese sulfate in order to make these plants as yield efficient and quality efficient as its isogenic parent. So uh, we just need to understand what the changes are that occur so we can compensate for those if we're going to use the technology. Second key would be the nutrient farm or availability. I've mentioned the farm of nitrogen. If you have uh, certain crop rotations, you're going to have a big effect on the farm of nitrogen because some crops will favor the nitrosomonas, nitrobacter bacteria in the soil that uh, bring about the conversion of ammonium to nitrate nitrogen. Other crops, climax ecosystem crops, inhibit that, block that reaction because they're toxic to the two bacteria or don't support their growth in the root system. So you have uh, an ammonium source, a more conserved source of nitrogen with the ammonium than you have with the nitrate. Most plants can utilize either form of nitrogen. There are some exceptions. Rice definitely prefers the ammonium. That's why it does better under paddy conditions than under upland conditions. Blueberries, the same. Nitrate is least, less efficiently utilized. But you can also then look at those crops that will delay nitrification and use those as pre-crops or cover crop in your cover crop mix to do as much as you would actually see even with the crop rotation from a disease control standpoint. So that if the plant is taking up ammonium nitrogen, the metabolism of that ammonium takes place in the root system because if it moved up into the vascular system it would be toxic to the to the cells just too much nitrogen in one one shot so it takes place in the in the root system this forms a carbohydrate sink and the carbon then moves down into the roots where it's combined with the ammonium to form 
the amino acids, glutamine and glutamate and asparagine that are then translocated to the rest of the plant where it's utilized for proteins and enzymes and other functions. If it's taking up nitrate nitrogen, you'll see that that physiology takes place up in the, in the vegetative parts of the plant, in the up above ground parts of the plant, and it can, nitrate can be stored to very high levels without being toxic. Ammonia is toxic at relatively low levels uh, unless it's converted to the amino acids. Well, it takes energy to, re to convert nitrate nitrogen back to the amine so that it can be combined with the carbohydrate to form the amino acids for growth and utilization then. But it takes place in the uh, foliar parts of the plant where ammonia physiology initially takes place in the root system. Roots are relatively leaky structures in a plant, and so you have a different rhizosphere biology with ammonium than you have with nitrate nitrogen. So you'll, it depends on those organisms that are involved and your soil borne disease levels. It becomes a very powerful tool for us to use for disease control by just uh, managing the form of nitrogen. And so you have these tables that will show all of the diseases that are decreased by nitrate or by an alkaline soil. In Florida, most of our melon growers and vegetable growers control their verticillium wilt primarily by using some limestone and nitrate nitrogen. Very effective control of uh, Fusarium oxysperum uh, species. But you have also then other diseases that would be more effectively controlled by the ammoniacal source of nitrogen. Both of the, both of the sources can be utilized by most, most plants equally well. Uh, but their interaction with other organisms and other nutrients is quite different. And that's where we see a lot of these differences. So with the form of nitrogen, uh, you can see with the take-all disease, root and crown rot on cereals, that the ammonium form of nitrogen, uh, which increases your manganese uptake and some of your other minerals, uh, gives you much greater disease control than a nitrate source. Uh, you can see that where in practice, where we applied ammonia to both of these plots. It's in northern Indiana. But you see where we didn't inhibit nitrification and it was converted to nitrate nitrogen fairly quickly. That yellowing is because there aren't a lot of functional roots left because of the take-all disease here. Very good control of this disease where we inhibit nitrification provide the ammoniacal source of nitrogen. The same thing with verticillium wilt of potatoes. That's why the corn preceding the potato crop provides about another two to four weeks of good growing conditions. It does delay maturity. So if you're shooting for that early market, and that's a concern for you, then you want to manage the amount of ammonia versus nitrate. And a lot of plants will do actually better with both farms because the nitrate can buffer against the ammonium. Potato scab, another example. Uh, in that situation uh, over here where you see the ammonium very low scab index compared to what we have with a nitrate source of of nitrogen there with the Streptomyces scabies. Uh, you can see that with verticillium wilt again, just comparing directly the two sources of nitrogen here and the effect on yield because verticillium is more, much more severe than uh, Rhizoctonia would be, which would be the other disease that they'd be looking at. And that can be reduced with just getting the zinc levels up.
had uh, a lot of concern with our hog farmers who were just dumping their liquid gold uh, from their manure pits out on a few acres because they considered it a disposal problem rather than uh, a nutrient resource. Tremendous nutrient value in that uh, liquid manure. But every time they put it out and then planted corn, which would have the high nutrient requirement to utilize the nutrients, they ended up with severe stock rot. And so they just would allocate uh, 100 or 150 acres more for disposal than they would for crop production. And we showed them if they would just add a uh, quart of, of nitropyrin as a nitrification inhibitor uh, to inhibit that nitrification in that hog manure, that they eliminated the stock rot. And you can see that up here. Here's where we have the same amount of, of manure going out, but here where we inhibited nitrification, so we kept it in the ammonium form, we didn't trigger that severe disease uh, pressure and have one grower that uh, uh, produced about five million gallons of that black gold every year with his farrowing operation, farrowing and finish operation. It said when hog prices, meat prices bottomed out one year, he made more on his manure where he was inhibiting nitrification to get that extra efficiency than he did on the meat from his hogs. So trying to utilize that resource uh, rather than use it as a disposal um, and pollutant aspect from the high phosphate, high nitrogen levels. A third key would be looking at the rate that's applied. We want to have that balanced nutrition again. That balance means that you need to have full sufficiency though for the crop. And this is tan spot on wheat. You can see about 100 pounds of additional nitrogen is, would be full sufficiency under the conditions that we had here. And you see as you increase your nitrogen rate, that severity of that disease drops off very, very sharply. And if we inhibited nitrification, in this case also with the nitropyrin, uh, at that 50 or 100 pound rate, we saw an additive effect from just, in addition to just seeing the uh, sufficiency uh, met on it. So we usually see the greatest response when we go from deficient to sufficient uh, for the plant to be fully functional when we see a reduced disease or a increased disease with excess amount of a particular nutrient. It's because we have an antagonistic or a synergistic effect with other nutrients from the particular nutrient in addition to the particular nutrient that we're applying. Now, as I'll mention with sugarcane in Guatemala, we find that if you delay meeting the, the nutrient needs of that plant by two or three uh, months, even though you later bring the level up to full sufficiency, you've lost eight to 10% of your yield because you can't recover all of that loss that uh, would have been gained in that first three months of growth. Again, you can see the, the increasing disease resistance with silicon, uh, getting that level up and the drop in uh, blast diseases, rice blast. So we can look at all of those diseases in these tables and a number of others that uh, to see that relationship then relative to the physiological processes that are involved in resistance or in disease progression. Uh, and that also holds for the insects. So that if you uh, can get your boron levels up, you'll see that your spider mite uh, pressure will drop dramatically on that. If you have uh, adequate manganese, 
you'll see that your aphid levels will drop because manganese is required for the uh, sucrose phosphate synthase enzyme that converts the glucose and fructose into uh, sucrose for storage. And aphids like the reducing sugars, but they don't recognize the sucrose. So that you'll have a high population of aphids, often with, uh, un under a manganese deficiency. If we just increase that sufficiency uh, or bring it up to sufficiency level, you'll see those pest pressures drop off. Time and, and uh, method of the application of the nutrients is a powerful tool because we can avoid some of the conditions then that would favor the pathogens, the disease of the pest. We're applying, we're meeting the needs of the plant at times when the pathogen isn't able to cause disease. And we'd see this in this example, it's with a cold temperature pathogen, Rhizoctonia cerealis, which we call winter kill. Well, it's active between 35 and 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Those are conditions where the wheat is pretty much dormant and your resistance becomes very low after uh, two or three months of being in dark, under snow and uh, uh, poor photosynthetic conditions. But if you'll apply your nitrogen before or after that kind of dormant period, you'll see that you have very limited effect on the disease because you're not feeding the pathogen. If you put it out at the same time that your pathogen is most active, then you also have uh, some stimulation of, of the disease organism. You find the effect of copper on uh, wheat melanosis, which is Pseudomonas bacterial pathogen. And you can see there are various ways that we can add copper. And uh, if we'll incorporate it, you'll see the biggest uh, drop from, from the banded. Roots aren't getting into that band or you don't have as much uptake if you band it than if you have it broadcast and all of the roots, over all the root system. See a foliar spray here or with the copper chelate to reduce the amount, or copper phosphonate. You can uh, use much less of it because it's more efficiently moved and available in the plant to meet those physiological needs. Uh, the fifth key would be nutrient source and associated ions. I mentioned that when you get into excess uh, supply of the nutrient, maybe the benefit that you're seeing may be from uh, the associated ion rather than the potassium or the particular ion that uh, mineral that you're providing. And you see that with stock rot difference between potassium sulfate and potassium chloride. Now, as Neil Christensen and his group in uh, Oregon have shown, the chloride also tends to suppress nitrification. So there's some effect on nitrogen form with the anion in addition to meeting the needs with the potassium. In Argentina, where they have severe sugar cane decline, all we did there was uh, we had identified the manganese and zinc deficiency. The best source of that, or readily available cheap source, they were dumping in the river, and that was the vanass. That's where all your minerals are from the sugar cane. We wanted to put that out, then provide it to the sugar cane, but we needed to do it uh, so that we didn't stimulate those bacteria that would convert the manganese to, from the two plus farm to the four plus farm. And so we put the finesse out at the same time that they would put their second application of potassium chloride and use the chloride rather than the sulfate farm because the chloride suppresses the oxidative manganese oxidizing organisms in the soil. California, when they clean out their drip lines and irrigation systems with hydrochloric acid, 
We have a period there that they have to be very careful or they're going to get manganese toxicity because the chloride again will suppress the oxidizers and also release a lot of that uh, manganese uh, that's been accumulating in those uh, drip lines. Again, the sixth is probably as important as the first key here, and that's making it fit your management program. If it doesn't fit your management program, you're going to be reluctant to use it. But if you make it fit, and there are plenty of tools to do this with, to make it fit your management with very little tweaking usually, and either organic or uh, conventional agricultural programs. But this is just two examples here. Uh, uh, the herbicide effect on take-all. This, uh, this field here was, we had in uh, uh, different herbicides that were conventional at the time when Roundup Ready soybeans became available. And so the plots were all set out from an herbicide standpoint for the soybeans. And then we just planted the wheat after it to see what that subsequent effect was on some of our other crops and other diseases. And you can see the tremendous increase in take all from the white heads on every plot that was following soybeans that had received the glyphosate because of its antibiotic activity to stimulate the oxidizing organisms. This would be the conventional uh, herbicide at that time, which still has some take all, but it's not nearly as severe as following the glyphosate with its broad spectrum activity rather than the conventionals with the very uh, narrow herbicide immobilization. Uh, this plot, is where we were just I had a grad student that was always asking questions and so we set up a lot of plots. Uh, she didn't always believe the literature and in the literature for 150 years it says if you have a firm seed bed you'll have less take all root and crown rot. She said well how come? I said well you've got a research planter out there that plants eight rows at a time and they have press wheels on them pull up four press wheels and take a look at it and find out. And so she did that, went out, and you can see here at this stage, we've actually lost a lot of plants in here uh, where we pulled the press wheels up, had that loose seed bed uh, from the take, we lost those plants from the take all. You see, if you could see that clearly, you'd see the copper and manganese and iron and zinc deficiency showing on those plants. When we analyzed plants from here versus where we had just that press wheel at planting, the only difference in those two, we had 14 parts per million more manganese by just having the press wheel. So if you look at the herbicides, all of our herbicides are mineral chelators. They all chelate uh, different minerals. Many of them are fairly specific, just one or two minerals that are really uh, changed in their availability with the herbicide. But if you want to shut down a physiological process, you chelate and immobilize that particular physiological pathway that's involved. And it's the minerals that are your activators and regulators of those physiological processes. So most of them fairly limited, so it's fairly easy to compensate for that uh, tie up of the minerals, but you get into the glyphosate and glufosinate, and they're very broad spectrum. Almost any cation, positively charged ion, will be uh, chelated, reduced in its efficiency uh, there. So that if we look at the widest used herbicide chemical, agricultural chemical ever applied. We apply about five billion pounds worldwide every year. Half a billion pounds just in the U.S. It's a very broad spectrum mineral chelator. It was first patented as a mineral chelator to clean out steam pipes and boilers in 1964 by Stauffer Chemical Company. 
patented 10 years later as a very broad spectrum herbicide because it's a broad spectrum chelator. Ties up a lot of physiological pathways. They say, well, it's the EPSPS. Actually, down regulates 291 enzymes and stimulates 30 others. It was patented then in 2000 as a very powerful antibiotic. We are concerned about 29 million pounds of penicillin and cephalosporin and tetracycline and those antibiotics that we use in medicine. We're applying again half a billion pounds of glyphosate in the states every year. That's a very broad spectrum antibiotic. You read the patent on it that Monsanto has. Didn't leave out any taxonomy at all in that patent, but it's very, the beneficial organisms are very sensitive to glyphosate. Your pathogens are all quite tolerant or even stimulated by glyphosate. Fusarium is one of the few organisms that can use it as a nutrient source. So you see that increase in, in that area. It can be very persistent. We're finding 20 and 30 years of accumulation of glyphosate because it's very difficult to degrade. It's also very difficult to analyze for so that we haven't had those tools until the last 10 years to really do a good job of of detecting how much is there. U.S. Geological Survey shows that in the Midwest and Florida, there are about two tons of glyphosate per square mile that have accumulated in the soil. CSIRO in Australia has shown that 20 years of glyphosate have accumulated as either glyphosate or its first degradation product, AMPA. So, you see that chelation activity. You see some of the effects of chelation. You can't kill a plant with glyphosate in sterile soil. What kills the plant is the stimulation of the soil pathogens. And it essentially gives the plant a bad case of AIDS so that any organism can come in and do the killing. It will stunt a plant in sterile soil, but it won't kill it because you need those organisms to kill it and they'll readily colonize and that's why it takes four or five days or a week for uh, the plant to really start to die after glyphosate application. I'll just get in, uh, may take time for it to detoxify in the soil. Uh, they say poof and it's gone, well, it's a very strong chelator of minerals so that it's detoxified but not necessarily degraded. It's persistence in a silt loam or a silty clay loam or clay loam soil. Half-life is about 20 to 22 years. And uh, aqueous sand may only be a year and a half. But the organisms that can break it down aren't real common in the environment. You're going to use the technology and you don't have it, I understand, in Belize, so you have that blessing. Uh, you don't see the sterile soils that we're seeing now in the Midwest and Canada and other areas of the world where they've applied glyphosate very heavily for a number of years. So that uh, I've been involved with a group of farmers in Canada, 18,000 acres that didn't produce a crop two or three years ago, the wheat got about this high and leaves, uh, lentils and peas didn't even make it out of the ground. But we uh, have looked at those things. You can look at the impact on cotton. You need to compensate if you're going to use this material as an herbicide, both from a biological as well as a chemical standpoint. I mentioned the citrus variegated chlorosis earlier, the xylella disease in Brazil. We used where we shifted to the brachiaria grass uh, the, as, and mulched that under the tree. We fertilized it to the optimum. <clears throat> uh, kept that ground, ground covered for disease control. And in three years, we're producing 110% of the uh, 
crop that they were producing before at a much higher quality and also at a much lower cost. You see the same type of thing with greening disease. We have five systems in Florida that will control greening. They're all nutrient-based. So that uh, this is an example of one. Uh, Frank Dean has another one. They're all modifications of the nutrition to emphasize the physiology that's involved in pathogenesis and resistance. So that if you block the uh, formation of that calcium manganese phosphate that precipitates then in the vascular system and plugs it up, you essentially have full disease control. And so that's what they're doing in this uh, area. The 300,000 out of the 150 million acres that used to be it in Florida are all thriving because they've adopted one of those five mineral programs. Very effective on it. Just an example of one that the USDA and the University of Florida took the farmer to court trying to get him, force him to chainsaw massacre his uh, citrus groves because he had a hundred percent infection. He said, I don't care about a hundred percent infection, I don't have any disease. Just because you can get a PCR test doesn't mean I should go out and destroy my income with a chainsaw and a bonfire. And uh, you can look at Maury Boyd, followed that nutrient recipe that he developed uh, initially. He modified it several times and look what happened to his neighbor that followed the chainsaw uh, massacre approach at the USDA and the University of Florida. Uh, we're trying to force on everybody, and uh, Maury was able to get enough political clout that uh, it gave other growers an opportunity to stay in business then. Remember that nutrition is an integral part of crop production. Uh, changes in nutrient uh, relationships not only affect yield, but also disease. You have six keys to use there. We need to integrate nutrition with our own management programs. It can be a very effective disease control mechanism. Now in uh, uh, Guatemala, two years ago, we convinced the mill to drop the glyphosate ripening process. We caught a lot of flack from that. A lot of concern uh, from the farmers that were involved in that mill. But our concern there was end-stage kidney failure. Predicted El Salvador, one out of four sugarcane workers will die from end-stage kidney failure from glyphosate exposure because of the use of it during the ripening process. What we did was we say, well, sugarcane, our objective is growing sugar. Why don't we just push it into that storage phase from the vegetative phase, and I'll cover this more in, uh, as I present Maria Fernanda Traz's presentation here in the next hour. But uh, uh, this year, the mill that uh, adopted that produced 31,000 ton, or a ton more refined sugar at 8% less cost than the, <coughs> with the nutrient uh, approach rather than with the glyphosate. You don't have the damage to the ratoon crop, and that's where a lot of that 8% less input cost, you don't have to fill in the holes where that accumulation of glyphosate and the uh, bud prevents its growth and its uh, benefit to you in the ratoon. So, I wish you success in your farming and your regenerative programs can be done, done efficiently, effectively, and it's a whole lot more fun. So uh, thanks again for the opportunity to be here.